Here we go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, AI Governance, Drive Compliance, Efficiency and Outcomes from Your AI Life Cycle, sponsored today by IBM. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Scott Buckles. Scott is the North America Business Unit Executive for IBM's Data Ops and Data Science Solutions. Scott has over 20 years of industry experience as a developer, consultant, and sales executive in numerous technology areas and industries. His focus remains on helping customers achieve their business goals by leveraging technology, process optimization, and people within an organization. Scott's passion for customers and technology has helped deliver results from the early e-commerce days to today's burgeoning world of advanced analytics and artificial intelligence and with that I will get out of the way and turn the webinar over to Scott to get us started hello and welcome thank you Shannon and apparently 20 years in this business or over 20 years still means that you have a hard time getting into a web uh, WebEx so my apologies for the delay everybody and thank you for bearing with us today and thank you Shannon for all the help and getting that figured out so it, I guess it's just further proof that technology is still hard from time to time so hopefully everybody's having a uh, a great uh, a great afternoon and a and a great last couple of weeks of this uh, probably the craziest year of our lives and uh, really appreciate you uh, joining us here today in what should be a, an interesting topic and I look forward to taking you through this and then also taking you through uh, some questions and answers at the end. So let's just start with a. Uh, Start with a picture. So, this is a uh, this is a wonderful picture. I, I've actually seen this picture in, in a number of my colleagues' presentations and and decided to use it um, because it's very uh, it, it's very stark. It's it's right in your face, and it, and and that is a bunch a bunch a bunch of garbage. Um, and when I think about this picture, it, it reminds me of of the uh, old adage, and we say this a lot, that garbage in, garbage out. So um, we say it to, in other ways to our kids, what you put into it, you get out of it, right? Whether it's your schoolwork or your sports or whatever. Um, and data is a lot like this. I mean, this is, it, it applies to data maybe more than any other place in, in the world. Um, or just as much as it does anywhere other place in the world or any other activity that we do. Um, data is, is, it's imperative that we uh, understand it, that we know where it came, for, came from, that we are able to trust it, and that we are then able to use it. And I think in this world today, we have all this great technology at our hands, and we sort of uh, well, we lean on it like a crutch, um, and we think because we have all these great uh, systems in place that we can, that those systems are going to make our lives easier and we can get away from some of the fundamentals. Um, there's a there's a former IBM executive, his name is Steve Mills, who is um, maybe the, 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 uh, the, the founder of really what became IBM Software Group, and and I remember hearing him talk one time, he said that there are things that we argue about in technology that we would never argue about in the, in the physical world. And the example he gave in this particular presentation was, he, he said, if you had to get 300 people from Los Angeles to Las Vegas, and you had to do it in under five hours, would you be, A, better off putting those people in 300 different cars or maybe uh, 150 cars? And having people travel and choose to for on the roadway on the highway from from Los Angeles to Las Vegas, or would you be better off putting them on a on a rather large plane and get them there um, within that period of time? Um, and a lot of times we we are like that would be really hard if you had four hours to get people from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. It, 
there's really only a couple ways to do it and, and get it into uh, that time frame and meet those requirements. Um, but a lot of times in, in, in the technology world, we would argue that there's a better way to do it or there's a different way to do it in whatever problem we were trying to solve. And um, you just, there, there's, there's times where the fundamentals still apply. The best part about being in technology and all of our jobs that we do day to day is that there's so much innovation. There's so many different things that are evolving and changing, and there's people coming in and they revolutionize the way we do things and the way it impacts the way we run our businesses or even uh, live our lives. And that part's exciting, but you can't get away from some of these fundamental truths. Um, and that is that you still have to put the work in. You still have to do, if you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. If you don't put a lot of effort into it, you're not going to get a lot out of it. Your data is the, the exact same way. One final analogy I'll give you, and I think about this because I was uh, doing Christmas shopping uh, last night, and I have three, uh, three young men, uh, 12, 10, and 7, and they all play hockey, and and they all want new hockey sticks. And if I go out to the different manufacturers of these sticks, Bauer, CCM, and others, and I see these latest and greatest technologies, and they talk about how it's going to make your, your shot harder, it's going to make it more accurate, it's going to make your passing more crisp. And I think, well, those are all great. And, it, and there's a ton of technology that goes into these sticks and a ton of engineering work. But if those kids or any other kid doesn't go out and shoot pucks in the garage and doesn't go to practice a couple of days a week and work on their shot or work on their stick handling, then they're not going to get the advantages or the technology that that stick brings out of it. It's going to, it's going to just sit there. It's basically not going to be there. They wouldn't know the difference between a, a $2 stick and a $200 stick at that point. And you, if you think about the, the, the folks, at any level, the highest level of any profession, whether it's a uh, an artist or an athlete or a business person, the amount of time that they work on fundamentals to become that successful. And if you think about a hockey player, the amount of training that they do, the amount of shooting the pucks and, and drills that they execute on the ice, off the ice, day in and day out, that's how they're able to take advantage of the technology that comes in, whether it's a stick or a skate or their other protective equipment, that's how they do it. It doesn't just happen magically. And I think a lot of times we think that that's gonna happen. And so when we think about AI governance, and we'll get into it a little bit, but it's really an, an evolution of some of the things that we've seen around data governance, or it is an evolution of data governance at its core. And data governance is something that really started out in a couple of different ways. Uh, the most notable way that we've all been uh, exposed to data governance is through compliance. Um, and whether it's a old banking regulation um, that's 20 or 30 years old or HIPAA uh, here in the United States or some of the more, uh, some of the newer regulations that are around data privacy like GDPR or CCPA and other forthcoming statutes on, uh, on data privacy from other states and other countries. Those are all driven in a reactive sense or in a compliance sense um, that we're trying to enforce or ensure that our organizations meet those regulatory standards. And those could also be corporate standards or corporate mandates as well. They don't have just to be uh, government statutes. And then the second piece of it is really around governance or insights. And this gets into more of a proactive use case. Um, this is where, when I think about the change that's happened in the last four or five years in our industry, where the, we've seen the role of the CDO take off. Um, if you go back six or seven years ago, there might have only been a handful of CDOs, chief data officers, around. And now almost every major institution has a chief data officer, and they're tasked with getting more out of their data. They're, they're tasked with not just the compliance part, but, but monetizing that data. Uh, delivering true business value with that data. And that's where we've seen some of this governance for insights really start to expand. So let's talk a little bit about the journey of how this happened. Um, we did a presentation uh, a, a couple weeks ago and we talked a little bit about um, 
the departmental uh, data governance journey. And there's been a lot of changes over this in this space over the last few years. Really, when uh, 10 years ago, the, the amount of effort, both in terms of labor and technology that it took to govern your data, made it limiting to where the compliance uh, uh, use case was really the only use case that that you could be successful with because it was too hard. It was too manual to be able to um, to govern your data at scale. And so you saw a lot of departmental efforts, a lot of siloed efforts, um, whether that was in operations or finance or in sales, there was a lot of siloed efforts and that yielded some value. Um, it helped change the mindset of people to say, I've got to find a way to get data quality injected uh, throughout my department. It's got to be on the forefront of my mind. And it became a, a help generate a mindset around the data has to be clean. The data has to be trusted in order to ensure that compliance. Um, and then that helped fuel more of those reactive, that the, the use cases, more of that compliance driven use cases. Um, but even then, it's not to the point where we're going to get a ton of ROI out of it. So then we start doing in these proactive use cases. These are the, the, the governance for insights use cases. Um, and now we're starting to get some momentum. And then when we take that across an enterprise, you know, starting from one department to an enterprise level effort, now we're starting to maximize our return on our investment. Now we're getting the thought process and the mindset that our data quality, having business ready data is part of our core operations. Just like going back to the analogy and uh, uh, around a hockey player, it, it's, it's now getting into, I have to go train every day. I need to go work on my skating. I need to go work on my, on my stick handling in my, in my shot in order to start taking advantage of the technology available to me that becomes ingrained in our thought process. And that's where we start to get some really great benefits that really help ensure compliance in a much more automated, automated way, excuse me. And then also start helping separate our business or our organization from our competition by delivering um, better customer service or a better product, better product quality. Um, a variety of different things, better profitability by understanding our different processes and maximizing um, our cost efficiency around what we do. And now that's all great. And, and we've done a, I would say that, that the cool thing is, is in the last three or four years, the attitude, attitude excuse me, towards data governance has gone from, uh, why do I have to do that, to, oh my gosh, when I do that, I start to see some benefits. Um, sort of like, you know, if you're going, again, I'll, I'll just carry this analogy throughout this. If, if you take a kid who doesn't want to go and do that work, and then you get them to do that work, even if they begrudgingly did it to begin with, but then they start to see the results and, and they start scoring more goals or having more fun playing the game, then it becomes contagious. It becomes ingrained in their in their approach to how they uh, take every day or every hockey game to go out and prepare for that. Um, data governance is just the same thing. And as we get into the AI world, it makes it that much more important um, because data governance is evolving and it's expanding and AI is forcing us to, for, for that expansion because there's more considerations that come into play that it, that we have to have those fundamentals and then build upon those fundamentals around data governance and started applying them to, to AI. So if, if we're not in, involved in an AI initiative yet across our organizations, the, the likelihood is that we were very well soon will be, um, or very soon will be, if I could talk. And this is Gartner. So it, in 2021, so this is, you know, starting next year, we're expecting to see 2.9 trillion in business value generated and recovering 6.2 billion hours of worker productivity. So 
and this uses the word augmentation, which I'm big on, and, and I know that um, it's one of the prouder things that, that I love about IBM these days in, in terms of our stance on the ethics of, of AI is in our approach to AI, AI, we're not looking for this to replace jobs. We're looking for this to augment jobs. And I think that recovered productivity and that uh, additional business value is really about helping our experts, um, whether that's a data engineer, a data steward, business analyst, data scientist, a sales executive, an operations executive, somebody, whoever it is across that organization, help them have more insights to make the, a better decision, not to replace them or replace the de decisions that they need to make, but help them have the insights to make better decisions. And the basis of, the, basis of that is having good, clean data. But as we will see as we go through the evolution into AI governance, it's also about understanding um, how we govern our AI models and our AI processes as well. But it all starts going back to fundamentals. And I'm big on fundamentals. I'm, I, 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 love, I, I love being able to, to focus on it. I think that they're so important just in life, like learning those, those good skills that you have to do, like to work out and to study hard and learning those traits. And if you get into um, a sport or a – uh, a job, like even a sales job, there's certain fundamentals that you have to have. And in technology and in data governance, that's what the AI ladder is about. Um, if you've heard anything from IBM in the last couple of years, you've heard us talk about this. But this is a, a roadmap or a ladder of the fundamentals around data that are imperative to being able to make your organization AI ready. To, um, to be able to collect all of that data, um, understanding where it is, making it simple and making it accessible, being able to organize. And that really comes down to what we're talking about in data governance. And data ops is, is an even more modern term for data governance that really starts to apply the methodology around the people and the processes along with the technology to get more out of our, our data and our data pipeline. Um, making sure that we have Analytics, we're able to analyze that deal, data and do it at scale. That's important as well, um, along with the trust and the transparency. And then being able to infuse um, a operational AI throughout the process. Um, and that that's if you can't do the first three things, it makes it really hard to start infusing uh, operational AI throughout all of it and have success. Yes, you can do it, but can you do it and have success? That's much more challenging. So let's look at how governance for AI really starts to evolve beyond just governance. So we started with the governance for compliance uh, use case and how that evolved into governance for insights use case. Now we're talking about governance for AI. And the thing that I that, that is really transformative here isn't just in, uh, it, it's not a technology thing, but it's understanding um, how those AI capabilities perform appropriately, ethically, morally, and legally uh, to mitigate market and social risk while benefiting business objectives. So it goes beyond just understanding where your data came from and understanding the policies, the data policies uh, that you have as an organization or an entity and uh, applying the right quality rules, enforcing those data privacy standards. Now we get into, okay, we created a model. Do we understand where the model came from? Do we understand uh, how that model was governed? Uh, was it done ethically? Was it done morally? Um, was it in compliance with any legal standards out there? And these are all evolving uh, components of AI, but they're very fundamental to, to the AI journey and we'll show some examples here shortly of where um, this, where AI governance has really helped uh, companies understand where they may have been exposures and then be able to correct the course much faster than they would have if they hadn't had that. So what is AI governance? Um, so if you believe that AI strategy is strategic imperatives, use cases, competencies, technologies, 
um, then th th let's start with that as a foundation. And, and by definition, AI is hardcore computer science. It's not magic. Um, it's not, uh, it's not the, something, it's not science fiction. It is hardcore computer science that we need to build off. AI governance is then model management. It's digital ethics, it's compliance, it's monitoring, it's ensuring quality across all of those models. Um, and then you also have explainable AI. And this really comes down to if, if, if I'm leveraging an AI model to help understand whether or not I'm approved for a loan, um, and I was denied that loan, helping me understand why and being able to explain it to me um, in a fair and equitable way. And so that if those, if that decision was traced back, um, those things would hold true. How important is AI governance in this world? Well, by it, a little over a year from now, the belief from IDC and the research that they've done is that 65% of the enterprise will task CIOs or CDOs to transform and modernize governance policies to confront these risks. So 65% in just about a year's time. That's pretty astounding. And I guess if you looked at it uh, out to 2023 or 2024, that number probably goes from 65 to 90 or 95% if you ask the same question in the same survey. Um, so we have to make sure that we have compliance in it, that we align our strategy with the regulations and legal requirements, that we, that we uh, maintain our trust, um, our customer sat, our brand value, um, and transparency to that. Those are going to be big. So we've talked about no trust, use your data for a long time in the, in the data governance world. Those same principles really carry forward a lot into AI governance because trust is so important. And if you don't have that trust or that transparency, especially with AI, it can be um, very detrimental to our brands, to our customers, to our overall business. And a lot of that starts with, with understanding uh, not just where your models came from, but also where your data came from that are helping uh, fill those models and, and with the with the fuel that they need to be able to generate the AI. Um, we also have to have efficiency. Uh, speed is still a problem, whether it's data governance or data ops or AI governance. Um, efficiency is still a, a, a challenge for most of us, and we need to be better about doing that at scale. Luckily, there's a lot of technology out there today where we are automating discovery of data. We're automating um, policy enforcement. So we set policies as an organization and, and an entity, and we are able to go out and, and enforce that uh, automatically within our, uh, within our data, you know, and even to the point of who controls, or excuse me, who has access to the data and making sure that it's delivered to the right people who have the access and the need for that data in a, in a time efficient manner um, with that high quality. So important. Um, and it's part of the evolution of where we're seeing from data governance into AI governance as well. And those principles carry forward. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, the, the idea of, the, of ensuring compliance is, it has never been more important to our business. Um, not just because of the monetary fines. And, and I think GDPR from data privacy is the one that is, I think on, has on top of mind for most people. GDPR certainly brought that to the forefront for a lot of folks. Um, CCPA in California and for all of those of us that do business or have clients in California certainly apply. And, and California is just on the leading edge of many other states uh, and countries who are setting forth data privacy standards. But this is the one that is really on top of mind and that we have to, um, in a lot of ways, use it as a, as a way to get funding for some of these initiatives from the business, but it's, we have to consider regulatory compliances uh, as just a core, uh, a cornerstone of, of everything we do so that we have it and that we know we're, we're compliant and we can, sleep at night knowing that we're compliant, and then move into what is really the fun stuff, which I think it gets into leveraging AI to help differentiate ourselves 
from competition, uh, improve efficiencies and things like that. So these are a few of the uh, of the things that are going on, and um, and I won't claim to be an expert on all these different uh, different uh, policies that are driving data privacy uh, as it applies as it excuse me applies to AI, um, and these are really AI level regulations. I, I think the most uh, complete one right now is SR eleven seven which gets into uh, model risk management and it describes the validation process that has to be done within financial services. Uh, that is uh, the one that is probably the most uh, implemented across the, 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 the um, or most complete in, in being implemented, I should say, uh, across uh, enterprises today. But there are a lot of evolving uh, standards around AI, a lot of regulations, Certainly data privacy is a big part of it, but again, it gets back to that, is it, is it ethical, is it legal, um, is it transparent so that I can have that, that trust from our customers or our constituents, who that may be, in that this model is helping and is done in the right way. And we've seen examples where companies have, uh, have leverage AI governance to help them understand that they may have an exposure. Um, Apple came out with their new credit card and quickly realized that through some of the process, the application process, that there was a gender bias and were able to correct it quickly. Amazon had the same thing around recruitment software. Um, uh, Facebook had it with, with uh, personal data um, and by understanding uh, the, the models that were in place by being able to govern them, they were able to quickly react and, and correct course. Uh, IBM is, a, is another example, uh, going back to the spring when there was a lot of talk about facial recognition software and IBM pulled its support from facial recognition development because of there was inherent bias in facial recognition software so that um, we could find better ways for security and things like that, um, but, but also standing firm for what we believed in uh, and, and leveraging AI to, to help us do that in a better and more effective way. So going back to this evolution here, if we think about this business ready data, we, we've talked about this uh, a lot over the last few years. I've talked about it some today, know your data, trust your data, use your data. Uh, now we are moving into this world of AI ready data. Um, know your model, trust your model, use your model. But AI ready data is an evolution of business ready data. It doesn't replace it. It doesn't replace the need to know your data or trust your data or use your data. It builds upon that and starts extending that to, uh, to the models that we are running with AI. It extends it to how we are using that model, how they are validated, um, who is validating them. Are those, is that in, is that validation process in line with our morals and our ethics? as a company and as an organization, and then also is it in line with, with the legal requirements that we have. So AI-ready data and AI governance really start extending and expanding upon the terms and the concepts um, and the practices that we have around generating business-ready data and start applying those to models and the other, the other co uh, components of AI that we talked about. Um, this is a rather involved uh, and, and complicated uh, chart that would take, you know, a lot of time if we wanted to walk through it, the, the flow chart here. But I think what I wanted, the reason I included it, the reason I wanted to share it with you today is AI governance it covers a ton of different roles within an organization. Um, and these are all people that are that are critical to AI governance and then are also impacted by and consume AI, so they're impacted by the output of AI governance. It's not just one or two folks. It's not just the chief risk officer, the chief data officer. 
It's across the enterprise. Um, and so as you think about your own organization and you think about evolving what you've done with data governance today, you start, you start to think about the roles. And a lot of these are similar roles, but it's even more expansive. And as AI gets a lot of airtime, if you will, in an organization as being the next great thing, remember that these fundamentals and these uh, that we have around data governance and that we're expanding those still apply. Going back to how I started this with, you know, with my hockey analogy with my kids, those fundamentals that you learn at, at 10, 12 years old of learning to um, go out and work hard, study hard, that you have to do more than just what you do in school. You have to learn more than just, or do more than what you just do in practice every day. That you've got to take the initiative and, and build those fundamentals, those work habits as a hockey player, if you will, or as a student. Um, you still have to have those same fundamentals and principles around data governance and that a lot of the same roles that we include or, or that we touch as, as we govern data, as we cleanse data, as we generate that, are also involved in the AI governance life cycle. They are constituents of it. They are players and, and integral parts of it as well. So leverage that as a way to um, get buy-in to the importance of this and help generating more efficient, more trusted, transparent, and, and, uh, and I said efficient, an efficient uh, organization around how you manage your data and then also how you manage your, your AI initiatives um, as you move forward into the next stage. So with that, um, I think we have a few minutes left for questions. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, see if I can see them by expanding my window here. But I think oh God, you, Chan, yeah. you guys were, were monitoring the chat as well. Yeah, we've got you covered. So, yeah, thank you so much for uh, the presentation. And uh, I'm glad, again, we could get you logged in and going. And we do have some questions coming in. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day um, Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and the recording, along with anything else requested throughout. So diving in here, Scott, uh, how do you differentiate a chief data officer and a chief information officer as they relate to AI? Well, I think it's an organizational thing, um, and it really comes down to, it, so when the CDO became popular a few years ago, um, I, I want to say that, that the statistic at the time was that a third of those CDOs reported into the chief information officer, a third of them reported into a uh, CEO, and the, a third of them reported into some sort of chief operating officer um, or uh, transformation officer, like a CFO, somebody like that. And so with a, it had a variety of different uh, reporting structures. And so I think whoever is charged with the AI initiatives is who is probably going to be most accountable, at least at the forefront, for ensuring that you have that AI governance um, but it is a consideration to, to think about when you, when customers, uh, set up their, you know, business or their teams to focus on AI, how does that apply to what a CIO's roles and responsibilities are within your organization versus what a CDO's roles and responsibilities are? Um, and then also balance that with like a chief privacy officer and a chief risk officer. So it, it, I don't think it's a, a real neat and tidy answer, um, but it really comes down to considering who has the responsibility for it uh, and how does that relate to the responsibility around ensuring data compliance and ensuring that you have high quality business ready data as well. And Scott, I think you covered some of this already, but uh, maybe formulated in a different way in the question um, provides a, a bit different answer. What is the main difference between data governance for AI and the operational transactional data? Does the same governance approach, uh, can it be taken for all data or not? What, again, what's the main difference? Well, I think the main, so to me, the fundamentals still apply. Um, whether you're, you're governing data for operational or you're doing something for AI, a lot of the fundamentals still apply. You have to have the policies, you want to be able to discover it. I think where AI extends or expands beyond what we're doing with some of the just 
the core data governance stuff as it gets into um, where the models came from, who created the models, are the, are the models done in a moral and ethical way? Are they done in a, are they, do they comply with legal standards? Because if we're using AI to help automate a lot of decisions, we have to ensure that, that those morality and ethics are, are applied to those models and are consistent and that we've gone through that validation process. So it really takes um, it, those concepts and starts expanding beyond just some core data governance concepts or, or fundamentals and brings those into the fold as well. So are we saying that AI is an enabler for a data governance strategy and its implementation? Are we saying AI is an enabler for data go Say that again. Yeah, are we saying that AI is an enabler for data governance strategy and its implementation? I think so. Um, I think absolutely. I think if, so I started out early in the conversation saying that I think the attitude towards data governance has is, is changed drastically over the last couple of years. Um, but I still think people are like, yeah, why do I got to do that? I mean, it's it's like, well, why do I have to eat vegetables? Um, but if we, so if we are looking for ways to uh, get more buy-in, I certainly think AI governance is a way to put a refreshing spin on the conversation that may be, you know, may, people may organizationally have some sort of um, bias against the word data governance as being old and lethargic and whatever. Um, and AI governance might be this whole thing that's new because it's around AI. So it can absolutely be an enabler. And even if it's more in the way of getting it budget, getting funding, resources, skills. Um, but at the same time, you have to be cautious because you still, it expands upon the principles of data governance and you still have to do those fundamentals as well as the AI governance fundamentals. And, you know, we get this question in relation to AI a lot, you know, how is an audit done in AI? You know, how do you manage the data quality? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And uh, I, I think that the, um, I, I would leave that to, to um, somebody that is even more versed in, in that than I am. Um, to me, to answer the question or take a stab at it, I, I think that your data quality, you know, audits that you have and how those policies are, are reviewed and um, it, it, adherence is ensured, um, again, it extends what you're doing there into the AI world and into the models. Um, but I think that that's also something that you have to be very specific about with whether that's a statute, a regulation, something within your own organization. There's a lot of corporate mandates. Or there's a lot of folks that are coming out with um, how corporations are viewing, viewing AI and how they're using AI to ensure that moral and ethical and legal standards are, are upheld and in harmonious with that company or that entity's beliefs. Um, and so you have to uh, apply those as well. And by set by apply, you have to review those as well, as well as any sort of data quality standard that you have. I love the vegetable restaurants. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, can the same approach for non AI data be applied to AI? And we've kind of talked about this a little bit already. And, but considering we, if, an organization has a well-governed non-AI data already, the AI data therefore um, will be trusted and more manageable, is that correct? Yeah, I think so. It certainly gives you a head start. Um, I would argue that there's a lot of us that still have a long way to go in ensuring that we are um, uh, called an expert level in, in data governance. Um, but the hard work that you do there pays off, not just in, in you know overall data quality, but data and um, business ready data, but it certainly sets a stronger foundation for you as you move into the AI world. And 
how should the data governance and AI governance organizationally be integrated? One unit, mixed team, separation of duties? Well, it's a great question, and I, I don't think there's really one answer. Again, I think it comes down to how the roles and responsibilities within a given organization or entity are, are divided. Um, certainly, in, in my opinion, I, I'm of the belief that it's an extension of the work that a, that a CDO would do. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of variables that, that we all have that, that are specific from one organization to another that help drive that. And the important part is, to me, and is understanding what those boundaries are between the different roles, um, understanding what the roles and responsibilities are. And if you do that, then, then you're able to figure out, you know, um, where best resides within your organization based on a, a multitude of factors. But, but those boundaries, as, I mean, boundaries, there's an old saying, right? Good fences make for good neighbors. Um, it, it really comes down to having those roles and responsibilities clearly defined in your organization and, and who's responsible ultimately for that uh, will be decided by, by how your organization is, it approaches its business. Because there's a lot of, I mean, that, that's a very interesting, I mean, I don't think that was very um, articulate, but in a lot of cases, I'll say it this way, people get caught up in the title of a CIO versus a CDO. Um, and there are organizations that don't distinguish between the two and the CIO is the CDO or the CDO is the CIO. So that's really what I mean by how you, what's best for your organization. Don't be so caught up in the titles, but the roles and responsibilities. I love it. So Scott, is model management about governing algorithmic models and can you provide examples? No, I, I, I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry, Shannon. Oh, sorry. It's model management about governing uh, algorithmic models. And can you provide examples? Um, it is. I'm trying to think of a, uh, of an example. Um, so I'll say it. This, so one example I'll give is um, even within some of our products, we have some machine learning models that are out there that are constantly, um, specifically around uh, data quality, and they're continuously learning as they are running and, and processing data, but also based as, you know, a uh, in our case, uh, how our product engineer is, is interacting with that or, or a data steward is acting with that uh, from a customer and giving them inputs into it. So that model in that case, uh, managing that algorithm, uh, who made changes, who made inputs to it. So if you had a data steward that is saying, well, you know, this, uh, I, th the model gave me this, but it didn't take these things into consideration. So I adjusted the model. It, it gets into a lot of that, those, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's even basic things like version of who touched that model, when did they touch it, did they change the data sources, where did those data sources come from that were hitting that model. Um, so those are some, some of the examples that come to mind. You know, kind of back to uh, organizational functionality here, uh, you know, as more corporate functions will be affected by AI governance as risk management, legal compliance, et cetera, what's the best approach to high number of the stakeholders with differing interests when too many cooks spoil the meal, so to speak? Oh, that's a tough question. I don't think I get paid enough to answer that question. No, I'm teasing. Um, <laughs> I think that that's a really hard thing for, I, I, to me, it, it, I look at it as, Where's your lowest hanging fruit? Um, and I get that everybody, whether it's the legal department or the finance department, operation sales, manufacturing, whatever it is, are all gonna wanna jump in line. Um, but it's about what's the lowest hanging fruit and managing the risk of it as well. That's a big part of it. So where, do I, where can, which department or business unit is gonna get the biggest bang for the buck by investing in this so that you can show ROI? I think the thing that we've learned, if you go back to the way data governance used to be done, is um, is an even application development. I mean, going back 20 years, you think about application, we would in the way we would 
develop them with waterfall approaches is you would spend all this time and money. Think about all these ERP implementations. And then you wait to the end and you're like, oh my gosh, what did I get out of that? Or it wasn't the right application. That's not what they wanted. Um, so the advent of Agile and DevOps and DataOps and a bunch of other things have helped us be more effective in that and in, in determining that. But you have to look at it organizationally of, of who's going to benefit the most, how do we manage that risk, and then develop that along with an overall AI strategy across your organization. Um, and and that's the, the difficult decisions that the business leaders have to make um with with that ai strategy and that's the importance of of collaboration with whoever that is that owns that whether that's a cio cdo chief research officer whoever it may be within your organization perfect and i think we have time to slip in at least one more question here so where do you think the line should be drawn on what ai deployment should be governed for example recent executive orders sort of excludes commercial common applications would you similarly carve out uh, exploratory data analytics? Any lines you think exist? Um, yeah, I, I think that that's, uh, I think that's a really tough question. I, uh, um, and I'm not sure I have a great answer because I think that you have to, each organization has to set their own standards um and they have to the, the, there's so many factors that go into that that it's really hard to give a, a, a succinct answer um because it's where are you in, in your in your data journey uh how mature are you um and then where are you in your ai journey and are you trying to put the cart before the horse as the old saying goes um so i think that those are uh, those are really specific questions to a specific organization and entity that have to be probably taken a little bit more intimately and, and know more details about what's going on to answer that effectively. That sounds good. And I think that's all we've got here, Scott. Thank you so much for a great presentation and so sorry for the technical difficulties logging in there. I'm glad we were able to find you, get you in and on here. It's been uh, great. Thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We very much appreciate it. Uh, and just again, reminder, I will send a follow-up email within the next two business days containing links to the slides, links to the recording and additional information requested throughout, including additional information to contact IBM and information there. So, Scott, thank you again so much. Thanks, everybody. I hope you all have a great and safe day. Awesome. Thanks, thank you, Shannon. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining us today. Greatly appreciate it.